So a little while ago, I came across a shard detailing the five big employers in Cyberpunk 2077. It outlines a little bit of what they're about, whilst highlighting some of the biggest benefits different corps offer employees. Things like paid holiday, exclusive discounts, and cyberware. And it got me thinking, if one were to be unfortunate enough to have to go and get a job out in Night City where the corps treat you more like a tool than a person, then which corporation would actually be best to work for? After not much digging at all though, it became clear that this was very much a race to the bottom, with the better question being which corporation actually succeeds as the least evil of the bunch. And believe me, that's a tough question to answer. So I'm going to be taking a detailed look at the five corporations listed here, weighing up varying aspects of each before deciding once and for all which is least bad. Ready? Then let's get to it. After careful consideration of each of the five, it would make sense that, especially given the events of the game, the worst of the five corporations to work for, as far as I can tell, is Arasaka. Now bear in mind there's gonna be bias here. I don't think there's any other corporation in the game who we get such a strong look into. With the Corpo Life Path, we literally start as an Arasaka counterintelligence agent, and it's immediately clear, that's a job where you're damned either way. Jackie, if you work in Arasaka counterintel, you're always fucked. We can see during this intro that even the Arasaka higher-ups are by no means free from the high risk of internal backstabbing. Arthur Jenkins, our boss at the start of the game, is quickly taken off the board by Susan Abernathy, the director of special operations in Arasaka's US branch. And towards the end of the game, she allegedly takes herself out also. I guess the intense levels of stress were finally too much. Hell, speaking of stress, we literally start the Corpo life path throwing up in a sink from attempting to quell it. And if we read V's office terminal, it appears we've been staying on hormone blockers for longer than we should. The intense nature of this job makes it literally impossible to do without chemical assistance. There's even a performance booster in our drawer. That said, much of this is likely true for all the companies. Night Corp, whom we'll get to, are celebrated for having just an 80 hour working week, and no doubt the norm therefore is significantly higher. In Arasaka, it may be upwards of 100, bearing in mind there's 168 hours total in a 7 day week, where you also need to find sleep, food, bathroom breaks, and dare I even suggest leisure time? Anyway, V, according to their employee report, is an excellent asset to Arasaka, though despite this, through no fault of their own, the start of the game finds us right in the middle of a higher up power struggle. In literal moments, we've lost everything with years of loyalty and hard work poured down the drain. It's clear, stepping out of line in Arasaka, or even just finding yourself on the wrong side of someone else's mistake, could even cost you your life. Again though, the same could be said for most of the corporations, definitely these five at any rate. There are certainly better ones and plenty of worse ones which we don't have time to cover in this video. Kandachi Arms manufacturers, for example, literally forbid laid off employees from working for competitors for 20 years. And I'd argue that Trauma Team and Netwatch, whilst pretty dangerous frontline style jobs, actually seem like arguably decent places to work. But more on that some other time, back to Arasaka. And in fact, let's zoom out a bit from V's personal experience and take a look at the company as a whole. Founded in 1915 by Sasai Arasaka, the company was taken to the status of Megacorp after World War II by Saburo, who envisioned using it to return Japan to the status of world-dominating superpower. The man in question is of course a tyrannical megalomaniac, and may have even nuked Night City after the heist if it hadn't been for the actions of his hidden hero of a son, Yoranobu, whom I discuss in detail in this video. Now Arasaka is valued as of 2077 to be worth 890 billion euro dollars, surprisingly less than I'd expected given that Alphabet, Google's parent corporation, is today worth 1.5 trillion, and Apple is apparently worth 3 trillion, though of course dollar and fictional euro dollar values may differ. 54% of the company is held by the Arasaka family, 15% by the board of directors, and the remaining 31 is listed publicly on the stock exchange. So we're looking at a very much centralised megacorp where you endlessly slave away to inhumane levels to further line the pockets of Emperor Saburo, who in turn will use his insane wealth to fund programs like the Relic, and allow himself to live literally forever, no doubt eventually ascending to the status of immortal god. That said, is there anything which Arasaka does to actually improve humanity on the whole? Some of the others here also have highly questionable methods and ethics, but there's no doubt they do sometimes change humanity for the better. Sometimes. Well, Arasaka specialises in three main things. Corpo security, corpo banking, and the manufacturing of goods. The security 
Activision will protect any client willing to pay the costs, making it a morally grey zone where the ethics are more delegated to the client in question. As an employee in this division, in fact as an Arasaka employee in general, you'll be equipped with a lot of the latest in cyberware. And in a combat-based job especially, this will mean combat implants granted to you at the expense of the company. You will of course be more in the firing line, though at least you'll be equipped to deal with a higher level of threats. So long as you aren't unfortunate enough to come face to face with a solo, you might actually get by okay. And one would hope that higher risk jobs would come with higher tier levels of equipment. As a bodyguard or security personnel though, your loyalty will of course lie with the corporation and not the clients. It's the reason Yorinobu didn't have a security detail. He didn't trust them. And if for whatever reason the Arasaka higher-ups ask you to zero someone, you'd better be damn well ready to do it or else get zeroed yourself. Equally, you could work in the manufacturing division. Arasaka makes some of the best weapons in the game. The Mazamune is my favourite assault rifle, the Yukamara and Kenshin are great pistols, and the Gash anti-personnel grenade is utter carnage. On top of that, they also manufacture the Mantis Blades and Griller Arms, so they're no strangers to cyberware either. In fact, in an ironic twist of fate, if you didn't already know, Johnny Silverhand's Silver Arm is a product of Arasaka. Ironic that part of him became the very thing he swore to destroy. They also produce Cyberdex and a few other bits and pieces. Now, we could debate the ethics of manufacturing weapons, but instead, let me draw your attention to the fact that they also manufacture a whole host of other everyday items. Ranging from cars, meds and clothes, to games and even food, there's no denying that the company do play an important role in a great many sectors. And whilst the hours working in a manufacturing plant may be long and less financially rewarding, there's no doubt a lower level of risk involved. Finally, the third branch, the Arasaka Bank, was a genius idea of Saburo's to invest into multiple up-and-coming corporations, granting them loans in return for a slice of many of tomorrow's moneymakers. And there's plenty of executive jobs across the corporation, and whilst it's by no means a safe role, I'd imagine you are on average less likely to die behind a desk in Arasaka Tower than out in the field. That is, of course, unless it's August 20th, 2023, and the tower you're working in literally explodes. But since this is 2077, that doesn't factor into play here. What does is three of the four current endings wherein we upload Alt Cunningham to the tower's subnets, and she in turn fries everyone simply for being Arasaka employees. Hell, even if you chose the devil ending, Arasaka Tower still becomes ground zero for Yorinobu's military coup, transforming those cushy offices into a war zone. And by the way, a shard in the Corpo Prologue states that in the event of an operational crisis, all employees, bar for undercover field agents, must report to Arasaka Tower, meaning they will force you to go to the place where you're most likely to die. I think ultimately, what puts Arasaka at the bottom of this list then is the benefit of hindsight. Now, most of the others may be just as morally corrupt and terrible to work for on a day-by-day -day basis as Arasaka, but at least you won't find yourself in the middle of a mass culling just for trying to do better in life. The data shard which inspired this video votes Arasaka as number one, and granted, the latest cyberware, a trauma team card, and a loyalty obligation of just 20 years does sound very okay in the context of this setting. But given that they really don't do much to improve the world at all, are just as corrupt as the rest, and all their employees within the tower have been killed twice now, I'd say it's a strong case to put Arasaka at the bottom. Of these five corporations, at least. This is Kang Tao. This is intelligence. That's a slogan I'm sure you've all heard time and again around Night City, but of all five companies on this list, this is one of the ones with the least amount of detail, making it a little harder to assess. That said, the few encounters we do have provide a vaguely good idea as to how these guys operate. So, Kang Tao is an arms manufacturer specialist who might argue produce some of the best weapons in the entire game, especially in the smart gun departments. The Chao Pistol, Dian SMG, and Zhou Shotgun are some of the best in their fields, with the guns themselves, or variants thereof, being among the highest ranked in my Weapons Ranked series. Additionally, the company Chienti is a direct subsidiary allowing Kang Tao to experiment with more stuff which they'd rather not publicly associate with. This, most notably, includes their Mark IV and V Sandevistons, which are arguably the best two you can acquire in the game, and definitely among the top four. Further to this, rare as an encounter is with Kang Tao operatives, you'll notice their armour is freaking 
awesome, sporting a far more chic design than both Militech and Arasaka, whilst upholding the company's intelligence claim. So what about working for them? Well, sadly, since we never do that directly, we'll never have as much info on them as we do for Arasaka. What we do have, for starters though, is the contents of the top 5 data shard, from which we can see that employees are granted a Trauma Team Gold membership, which from what I can tell, is just the really good ambulance service part. However, in terms of recovery and rehabilitation after an accident, it appears services in that field are still reserved exclusively for Platinum members. Still, there's at least some sense of security with the Gold membership. What places Kang Tao down here on the list though is a 50 year loyalty pledge which that comes with. I mean, in today's standards, that is pretty much a working lifetime. A job at Kang Tao is a job for life. It's what makes Arasaka's 20 year pledge sound so good by comparison, even though that is terrible too. And herein lies a systemic problem with this system. By locking employees in to practically lifetime deals, there's no competition, no struggle to hold on to good employees. They don't need to set a competitive wage or, you know, humane working hours because there's no threat of skilled employees getting pinched by competitors. They can set hours as high as they want, wages as low as they want, and there's literally nothing anyone can do. They are locked in with this company for half a century. And what are the consequences for breaking Kang Tao's rules? Well, if you saw my recent video on Santo Domingo's gigs, you'll see exactly what the consequences are in the job nasty hangover. Granted, Carl Ginsky losing a top secret data shard to 6th Street is a pretty big cock up. But even despite the fact that he has the data shard back by the time the higher ups arrive, Carl is still met with zero forgiveness. How do you do, Carl? We almost fucking had it. Like I said, these megacorps leave zero room for error, and when V attempts to speak with them, they don't kill us to be fair, but they do address us like a piece of shit on their shoe, dropping a cred ship just to watch us stoop for it. That's it. Had a girl. Oh. Bitches always get down on their knees. The most prominent encounter we have with Kang Tao though is the main quest Life During Wartime, wherein we take down an AV carrying Anders Hellman who defected from Arasaka to Kang Tao after Yorinobu stole his relic project. It's a pretty well armed vessel but is taken on by us without too much trouble. The reason Hellman's security detail was so small though comes down to a key component of how Kang Tao operates secrecy. Indeed, every Kang Tao division we ever come across is well equipped, but small. Again, leading back to their claim that this is intelligence. They're aware that sometimes you can achieve just as much with a small strike team as you can an entire army. Just ask Ramsey Bolton, or to offer a much more obvious and contemporary example, Johnny Silverhand. And I don't know about you, but I'd favour my odds of survival more working covertly than I would being a foot soldier. Plus, again, we get to wear this awesome armour. I wonder how different difference it will look in 50 years time when we're given the option to quit. Yeah, it's a tough one this due to the lack of specific details, but I think putting it in this position feels about right. Coming in at number 3 for this list is the company we probably know the second most about after Arasaka. Militech is essentially the de facto US military, albeit one that's privately contracted. They can, just like Arasaka, be hired by pretty much anyone, and they're held far less morally accountable for their actions than any government led military. The mentioned big benefit they offer is a 50% stuff discount on military weaponry, with the article stating that this means a Mark 31 HMG at Christmas time under the tree for each of the family. Now, don't get me wrong, a 50% discount is nothing to scoff at, even by today's standards. And with some of the prices Militech charge, this is a hefty amount of money saved. It's also a kind of genius move in that they're upping sales to their employees and no doubt still turning an okay profit. But I can't help but feel that by focusing on this discount, the article is failing to examine the actual working conditions within the company. And well, they're certainly not great. Much like Arasaka, Militech appears rife with faction infighting. We're exposed to this very early on during our encounter with Meredith Stout, who is holding a fellow agent, Anthony Gilchrist, on suspicion of being a mole for Maelstrom. And depending on how we choose to play the pickup, either Meredith or Anthony will come out on top, with the other being killed. Again, it's a high risk power game at the top, whilst working as a subordinate will put you at the mercy of the higher ups. In fact, it's remarkable how many parallels there are between Arasaka and Militech. 
and the two Megacorp superpowers are indeed a good match to go toe to toe with one another. In 2077, it's looking as though the two are gearing up for yet another corporate war in fact, which I guess also doesn't bode well for the survivability of both companies' employees, though it's going to take a sequel for more insight as to how that plays out. And after looking more closely, Militech have way too many atrocities under their belts, not to mention terrible treatment of retired employees, to warrant my support in the coming war. Let's take a look at just a few. For starters, way back in 2023, Militech provided Johnny Silverhand with the Fissar material that he needed to nuke Arasaka Tower, and much as he claims this was a great act of heroism to stick it to the Corpo Swine, it did result in thousands of innocents getting caught in the crossfire. But did it save more lives than that by changing the course of the war? Well, that's a difficult one to answer for certain. So let's fast forward to 2077. Out in the Badlands, we can encounter a number of gigs which involve Militech specifically implementing technology to capture and kill nomads. Now, granted, not all nomad tribes are great people. The likes of the Wraiths are the worst of the worst, in fact. Though that's not the reason I think Militech cracked down on the group so much. No, you see, nomads offer a way of life different to the suffocating corpo rat race taking place within the city. Whilst nomads do privately contract themselves to work for Megacorp sometimes, they ultimately can't be tied into long contracts and total submission like your average employee. In many ways, it's the ideology that they spread for a life of freedom, family and loyalty, which is the biggest threat to this hyper-corporate society. I believe Militech think by wiping out the nomads that they will be increasing societal compliance overall. And so, they develop radars capable of better tracking nomadic movements, capture strangers looking shifty around the border, and evict small settlements, often with unwarranted violence, with little to no warning. A good example of that last one takes place way out here, where Militech recently occupied this settlement, seemingly killing all residents. Amongst them, though, were two Militech vets named John Obmar and Samuel Teasel. And it's apparently only due to their veteran status that Militech actually gave them a chance to leave in the first place. They would have genuinely slaughtered this whole place without so much as a warning otherwise. The two attempt to fight back, and it clearly doesn't work. They're taken out without a second thought. So Militech may be just about an okay company to work for at the time, comparatively, but they will hang you out to dry after you leave without a shred of loyalty. Another two sad examples of this can be found back in the city during the backs against the wall and going up or down gigs. Two ex-vets, both struggling with an onset of cyberpsychosis, both not receiving any of the help they need. In fact, we can learn with El Gaio, who's trying to fix the elevator, that Militech deliberately make all their contracts long and confusing to stop people figuring out how to claim financial support on sustained injuries and such. Max Jones, in fact, an apparently honest Night City journalist, started looking into and actually interviewing these screwed over veterans, who had to do things like return all their implants and other things. For doing this, Max gets a target on his head and we're sent in to save him. Clearly, Militech are happy to commit further atrocities in order to cover up their previous ones. Oh, and they also have this whole shoot first, think later attitude, which is not great for people who come across them. On the bright side, they do stock the Achilles Precision Rifle, Ajax Assault Rifle, Lexington Pistol, and Saratoga SMG, which are all very good guns, especially at 50% off. Is that worth selling your soul and undoubtedly committing war crimes though? It's a tough one to weigh up, especially when we consider that all the other companies will probably make you commit atrocities too. Hopefully we'll get more insight into Militech though with Phantom Liberty, what with Rosalind Myers having been Militech CEO before she became president. We now come to the final two. Both of these are still pretty terrible companies, but I suppose both of them do at least have some good intentions sitting behind all the backstabbing murders and mind control. Biotechnica rose to prominence in the late 90s after cultivating a renewable alternative to fossil fuels by breeding a strain of wheat which could be refined into a biofuel powerful enough for vehicles. They licensed its production to Petrochem and used the profits to fund further scientific endeavours thereafter. And in a pretty smart move on their part, they prevented the farm more powerful Petrochem from betraying them by possessing a virus capable of wiping out all the wheat strains and rendering their seeds infertile. Biotechnica then also literally have the power to switch off the world's oil supply if they wanted to, but they don't because it's far more profitable to sell it. It's more of an insurance policy, one which, let's hope, never leaks out into the environment. Getting into the early 2000s and Biotechnica's goals started to focus on cloning. They began to rejuvenate environments destroyed by climate change by bringing back 
back extinct flora and fauna. They also have successfully re-implemented human constructs into cloned bodies in the past. A solution which could totally work for V, depending on how long it takes to grow a clone. On top of this, they've produced countless medications and vaccines, all stuff with the potential to further benefit humanity. Their huge stretches of farms south of Night City provide citizens with a good supply of food, and they offer six, yes six, paid vacation days per year. That's apparently their biggest employee benefit, which I suppose means all the others offer less vacation days than that? Anyway, sounds like a decent company to work for. A good and productive force in society. Except, yeah, not so fast, because there's caveats. Of course, there's caveats to a plentiful degree. Their experiments don't always work as intended, and when they go wrong, they very often kill a lot of people. I think the best example of this in the game is the Red Ochre Clan, 70 of whom died a horrible, painful death after being exposed to just one of Biotechnica's experiments. What they were exposed to was so potent, in fact, that a Biotechnica employee straight up lost an arm just for handling some of the Nomad remains. Kind of makes you realise that as an employee working here, all it takes is exposure to one bad experiment and your life is ruined or straight up over. But even if you survive all the nefarious scientific practices, you'll still have to perform utterly inhumane experiments on others. Of course, guys like Alex Pushkin choose to dehumanise the test subjects with methods like viewing nomads as roaches. Besides, they're like roaches. Disgusting things will just multiply again. You think that's bad? Biotechnica also frequently buy patients from Night City's psych ward in order to have more disposable test subjects. When we head there for a gig, in fact, we can learn that they're currently looking to acquire pregnant women in order to test the frequency of miscarriages with their new drug Cyzalon. But on top of their awful experiments, they also aren't afraid to steal other people's really good ones. A little encounter over here in Charter Hill features an independent horticulturalist who has successfully bred a new strain of tomato resistant to blight and other diseases. But when attempting to sell their success on to Biotechnica, Biotechnica claim unauthorised genetic modification is illegal and forcefully seize the crop, killing the one who created it. And on top of all these terrible atrocities, just to finish off, you know those farms I mentioned earlier which supply Night City with food? Yeah, well it turns out a percentage of that may very well be human meat. Cloned human meat, so it may never have been sentient, but still, forcing the entire city to unknowingly become cannibals doesn't exactly look good on a track record if that ever came to light. Alongside the inhumane experiments though, is also the same corpo backstabbing we've seen play out across the other corporations. If you saw my video on the city centre gigs, then you'll know just how deep the Red Ochre experiments run, as well as the great lengths the director Joanne Koch went to to absolve herself of blame for all the deaths. She'd pin things on other employees, then have them assassinated so they can't defend themselves, and she'd also order hits on anyone who went against her or tried to expose her. Again, no matter where you are on the corporate ladder here, there's nothing to say you won't get unlucky one day and wind up a fool guy or worse. And even if you expertly whack-a-mole your way out of the horrible situation like Joanne did, there's still nothing to say that people you wronged won't hire the best merc in Night City to cart you away in a flying rubbish skip. That all said, the reason Biotechnica is still so high up here is because regardless Regardless of their abominable methods, many of their advancements still ultimately have a positive impact on the human race. And once history washes away all the atrocities they committed to get there, the science and the knowledge should hopefully still remain. I'm not at all saying the ends justify the means, I'm merely saying that some positive impact is left, even if it doesn't ultimately balance out the negative things. Also, they have like tons of deadly toxins and viruses stored away in their labs, and to be fair, they may just as easily have the worst impact impact on humanity by accidentally releasing one and causing a chemical apocalypse. So yeah, they could defo be a lot more honest and transparent when they do science, even if that does technically mean slower progress. Finally then, Night Corp was voted number 5 on the data shard, but in my opinion, and this may just be down to less knowledge being available, but they are, for my list, number 1. Now, if Kang Tao is like 6 on the secrecy scale, then these guys are definitely sitting at about a 9. Very little is known about their internal workings, but what we do know is that the company was founded by Richard Knight, who also founded Night City as a whole. Its purpose, it seems, is to work towards improving the city. Better services, education, that sort of thing. In fact, it was Night Corp 
Corp who funded Jefferson Perales' education and turned him from a street kid into future mayor of Night City. Additionally, they bought up the NCART subway system and in 2077 are working on the Maglev Tunnel to better connect Night City to the East Coast. We hijack their drill and use it to burrow into Arasaka Tower during the Aldecaldo ending. Now, Night Corp's big benefit is that their mandatory working week is just 80 hours, which works out to 16 hours a day in a 5 day working week, or more likely would be 12 hours across 7 days with a shorter 8 hour day for one. Yeah, live to work is taken to a whole new level in 2077. You can see why gangs are so successful and so many people become freelance mercs. Main reason Night Corp is at the top of this list then is because their intentions sound somewhat okay. I mean, improving education and the quality of living in the city is certainly no bad thing. And the work hours will guarantee you at least a little bit of time to yourself, after you're done working towards seemingly actual good. The problem is that we know so little about them, and the brief snippets of what we do get are actually alarmingly sinister. Item 1 then is Sandra Dorset and the full disclosure side quest. For this, Sandra asks us to retrieve a databank containing stolen Night Corp data. Breaking into it, we learn that Night Corp have been using an AI to perform experiments on Night Corp employees of the lowest ranks, who were fully unaware they were being experimented on. However, not long after this, one test subject began to exhibit psychopathic tendencies, strangling a colleague over a coffee dispute before jumping from the 16th floor window. The entry ends with Night Corp mentioning they're ready to move on to their intended targets, which I would guess is none other than the future mayor of Night City, Jefferson Perales, whom we learn is being subjected to much the same kind of subtle conditioning. Now, we also know Mr. Blue Eyes is heavily involved with that, and in one of the endings, he also claims to have the resources to be able to save us if we can stage a successful heist up in the Crystal Palace for him. The main theory I derive from this is, yes, Night Corp do indeed want to make Night City a better place. Their ultimate way of going about it, though, appears to be the mass control of the Night City populace. Not through some militaristic totalitarian regime, but through methods so subtle that nobody would even be aware that it was happening. Of course, it makes sense then to start at the tippity top with Night City's ultimate decision maker, the mayor. Control him, sway his choices this way or that, and putting the infrastructure in place to control everyone else will become a lot easier. The end result? Well, Night Corp uses an AI, or maybe an AI uses Night Corp, to subtly condition the Night City populace into obeying its every whim. Now, initially, I viewed this idea as outright abhorrent, stifling humanity's capacity for free will and potentially, as was the case with Jefferson and Elizabeth, rewriting people's memories. And I still mostly stand by this sentiment. I'd say on the whole, this could very likely turn out like some twisted form of 1984. But let's just ponder, theoretically for a moment, what if this technology could be tweaked to instead be able to tone down people's capacity for unwarranted violence? What if it were capable of helping each person to unlock their full potential, to become the very best version of themselves that they can offer, to set aside all their negative caveats and focus on the things which will truly give them fulfillment in life, not by forcing them to make those decisions, but rather by removing any personal restraints someone may have which hold them back. Things like fear of failure, laziness, depression, anxiety. So what if the scavs, for example, could be conditioned to stop harvesting people and go and seek a far more fulfilling life? In a way, you've got to ask how different that is from giving a young Jefferson Perales the opportunities he needed to become one of the most inspirational success stories in Night City. It's very interesting food for thought. I think the main problem I have with Night Corp's methods, though, is that they're doing it without telling people. Granted, if they straight out came out and said, look, we've got this tech, our AI is going to help you unlock your full potential and feel like a better person through some casual constructive guidance, then there'd be a good handful of people who'd happily accept that. Equally, as always, plenty of people would justifiably object for a multitude of reasons. And I don't believe that Night Corp should be able to force anyone to do anything even if that makes them a better person and a better member of society. And if you went and worked for these guys, then who's to say that you wouldn't be subjected to the early form of this technology, have your personality rewritten, and ultimately maybe even jump out of a window. Something else in the report, by the way, is that Night Corp don't even seem to care very much about that employee. Again, they're yet another corporation who want to exercise power and control, only under the employee of these guys, you may also wake up one day an entirely different person and never know that you were once completely different. Still, you do get to work less hours, you might wind up doing some good for humanity, if not, you'll just do some good for Night City, and the odds of getting killed in this one, at least as far as we can tell, are significantly 
significantly lower than the other four, placing Night Corp as the best company, in my opinion, of the big five to work for in Night City. Though realistically, they are literally all terrible, and if I were you, I'd definitely go and join the Alder Caldos, or become a musician, because they seem to actually have a really nice time in Night City, unless they get killed and replaced by a copy, which is a conspiracy that I've got bubbling away for another video. Anywho, let me know in the comments which Night City Megacorp you'd want to work for and why, whether it's one of these five or a completely different one. And if you want to uncover even more details for this game, then I have a series linking together all of the hidden storylines which can be found during all of the gigs. As always, a huge thanks to my patrons for continuing to support the channel. As I've mentioned before on the channel, I'm determined to only take on sponsorships which I genuinely use and can vouch for, and Patreon support gives me continually more freedom to continue doing that. Finally, if you're already planning on getting Phantom Liberty, or anything from their GOG store, then doing so through my link in the description is another way to passively support the channel. Finally, thank you very much for watching. I'm Sam Bram, I sincerely hope that corporations never actually wind up like this, and I'll see you soon in another video.